crucible of God. I looked up this word crucible. The word crucible, literally, it comes from the Latin word crux, which means cross. But what it describes is a, as a searching or a severe test or a trial. Now, when you're really looking at a crucible, if you Googled it and you looked up images, what you would see is like a little container where metal is melted. You know, back in ancient times, they would use clay because clay can handle really hot fires once it's been tested by the fire. And nowadays they have various crucibles. I can remember my brother-in-law, he, he makes teeth or, or he used to make teeth or crowns is what he did. And there was like a little ceramic. Nowadays they use ceramic and he would, he would stick all the, the metals in there and he would heat it up and it would melt. And then he would be able to, to allow the metal to, to go into a certain form to where it would be molded to, to what he needed it to look like. The crucible in ancient times, they, once again, they would use clay and it would allow uh, metals to be melted, to be refined. And it would also allow, as time went forward, for certain metals to be mixed, which forms an alloy, which is something that whenever two different metals are formed together, that it makes a new metal. The refiner's flame is one of the oldest methods of refining metals. In ancient times, this form of refining involved a craftsman sitting next to a hot fire with molten gold or silver. It was in a crucible. It would be stirred and skimmed to remove the impurities, some are also known as dross. That was another word for impurities that rose to the top of the molten metal. You see, once that fire hits the metal and it begins to melt and it's manipulated and it's moved and it's stirred, it allows the impurities to come to the top where the refiner, the one that's dealing with the metal would be able to remove it. You know, whenever you get saved, if you're saved this morning, what does it mean to be saved, preacher? It means that you heard the good news about Jesus Christ and you believed it. What the good news of Jesus Christ teaches us is that we were all born in our first birth in Adam. What does that mean? It means that Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. Adam was created and there was no sin in him. But then him and Eve went the way of the serpent and they allowed sin to come in. And through the birth, the physical birth, we received the nature of our father Adam. That's why the Bible, that's why Jesus taught that man must be born again. It's talking about a spiritual birth. It's talking about the fact that when we hear the good news about Jesus Christ, that when we hear it, we believe that it's true. We believe that we were born in Adam as sinners and that we must be born again. And we yield our heart to God and we say, yes, Lord, I surrender to you. Please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And when we do that, what the word of God says that when we believe with our heart, not just our head. See, it's not good enough just to believe uh, cognitively or intelligently that, that God sent his son Jesus. And, and it's not even good enough to believe in your mind that he, Jesus died on the cross and even that he died for your sin. But no, instead, we must believe from the heart. The inner man must, must agree with God. And the inner man must surrender to God and say, yes, Lord, I realize I'm a sinner and I do believe that you made a way. And the way that you made was you sent your son Jesus. And when we believe that with our heart and we confess it with our mouth, the word of God teaches us that a new man is created, that there's a new birth, that we become born again, and that the Holy Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of us. But listen, now we're in a process. So if you've never been born again, I got good news for you. You can be born again this morning. Amen. But if you have been born again, that's just the beginning of entering into the process. It's almost like an alloy where there's Two types of metal that come together. See, when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, you now become a partaker or a sharer with the nature of God. At the same time, you still have the nature, the sinful nature on the inside of you. And so God begins a process of working to where there's less of you and there's more of God. A refinement begins to take place. And God allows certain things to happen in our lives to bring us through a trial. So called, he puts us in the crucible. He puts us in that, that, little, that little cup, that little container that can handle the heat. He creates and orchestrates a trial for our lives or multiple trials that take place. And he allows these things to happen to bring us to the place where he can deal with us. 
Because just as the refiner deals with the metal and heats it hot and allows the impurities to come to the top, God desires that we would look more like the Lord. Amen. Romans 8, 29 says this. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. That means that God planned in advance. He had a plan where he would change people's lives. Amen. And the plan that he would change people's lives was that he would send Jesus. It says that to conform us to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. You got to understand this word conform means to be fashioned. God takes us and just like the refiner, he fashions us and he begins to pull things out of us that he doesn't want there. And he puts things in there that he wants in there more of his nature. You know, regarding Job, it's. Job is famous for being the man that endured the greatest trial known to humanity. I mean, he's the one, anybody really that has heard anything about the Bible, when you speak of Job, they'll know exactly the first thing that is going to come to mind was, man, Job went through a lot. <coughs> and in the midst of his trial, God was silent. That's what he said in, in the passage that we read. He said, I, I don't see you on the left. I can't hear you on the right. I look backwards. You're not there. He endured the greatest trial, but in the midst of the trial, God was silent and seemed to be nowhere to be found. And there are times in our lives where we need God and we cry out and it seems as though he's silent or he's not there. Have you ever felt that or am I the only one? That sometimes I'm going through things and maybe it's even things that are close to me and not specifically me. And I'm crying out, God, I need you to show up. I need you to, to do something in this situation. And it's not happening as fast as I would have expected it to happen. For some of these reasons, we can relate to Job because we've all faced trials in our walk with God and we've all faced situations where it felt like God was quiet and took his time showing up in our situation. But in other ways, Job seems beyond normal humanity. I mean, what I mean by that is, is that he, he endured so much. And, and at the same time, he never cursed God. His faith in God seems to be superior to most humans that we know. And anyone in their right mind would never want to face even a little bit of a portion of what Job faced. And then to think that the Bible spoke of him so highly even before he was tested. And then we consider our own failures and we look at our own lives and we wonder, God, why did you put that man through such a test? And God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. One thing that we should always be reminded of with Job is that God used the life of Job. This is very important. I remember when the Lord first showed me this. God uses the life and the story of Job to peel back the curtain of heaven for a moment for us to be able to see where we can get a glimpse of the spiritual battle that we face in our walk with God. I want you to, I want you to know that. That, that God faith, that God put, peeled back the, the, the curtain of heaven and he allows us to see a, a piece of that spiritual battle. We learn valuable information in reference to the spiritual trials from the book of Job. Number one, we're in a spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, Satan is constantly accusing God's people. Did you, did you know that, that Satan hates the people of God? We, 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 don't, we don't know everything that, that we, that, of what Satan is, but one thing that we do know is that he's real according to the word of God and that he hates the people of God. In Job 1.6, it says this. It, it gives us a, a, a picture of what was going on. It says there was a day when the sons of God, and I don't have time to really break it down, but what that's talking about is it's talking about fallen angels. You just got to trust me on that. When you study it out, it's talking about fallen angels. Fallen angels uh, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also with them. 
In Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 through 10, it says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. See, that's what he does. He, and, and this is a picture that we're getting in the book of Job. We're seeing that Satan and the fallen angels are actually going into the presence of God. And they're beginning to accuse Job. And they're coming against him. And, and the enemy of your soul does the same thing in your life. His hand against you, but I need you to understand this. His hand against you cannot extend any farther than God allows it to. In Job chapter 1, verses 11 through 12, this is the same scenario where, where the, the enemy has come to God. And this is what the enemy tells God. Because see, God said, but have you considered my servant Job? The God that we serve is, is always wanting you and I to, when we face trials and tribulations, when we go through things, to hold on to him and to make it through the trial. And the enemy turns around and he tells to God, but put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. See, the enemy was telling God, God said, look at my servant Job. And the enemy said, yeah, but you've protected him. You've built a hedge of protection around him. And if you would remove your hedge of protection from around him, then you would see what he would do. And he would turn around and he would curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself put not your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. What I want you to know is this. Sometimes when you're facing trials and you're facing tribulations and you don't know how much more you can handle, you and I have to come to the realization and know according to the word of God that the enemy of your soul cannot go any further than what the Lord allows him to. Our hope and our trust has to remain in God through it all. Amen. Amen. From this point in the story until the end, we see commonalities that we find in our own lives. The people closest to Job, Job don't show compassion. The people closest to Job, Job don't show compassion. Instead, they just point out where he was wrong. And whether it's really true that this happens in our lives or not, Satan is a master at helping us to think that everyone, including God, is against us. When we are being tested, Satan is a master at making us feel like everyone around us has abandoned us. Has that ever happened to you before? Amen. When you're in the midst of a trial and, 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 you fight, and you're looking for somebody to tell you what it is that you want to hear. You're looking for somebody to help you and it just seems like that all you're getting is, is more negative feedback. I'm here to tell you that sometimes the feedback isn't really as negative as what we think it is. But the reality is that the enemy is perverting it in our mind. And he's, and he's speaking to our ears. And he's trying to convince us that nobody loves us. That even God is against us. And he's trying to cause us to curse God. To shake our fist in the air in the face of God. And, and, and to turn our back on God. I need you to understand that if you're a Christian this morning. The enemy of your soul, everything that he plans surrounds the fact that he wants to cause your faith to be destroyed. He wants to cause you to turn your back on the Lord. Amen. That's right. The enemy wanted to throw everything that he could at Job. And, you know, in the first, I, I'm not going to go back a little bit later in that passage. But he, God said, you can touch everything that he has. Just don't put your hand on him. Yeah. Yeah. And he destroyed, he killed all of his children. He killed all of his cattle. He lost everything. And one, one day, everything that Job had, Job had was lost. And then the enemy came back again and said, oh, but you protected his person. Let me touch him and see what he does. And then God gave him permission to do that. All I know is this, is that God allows us to see through this story in the heavenlies, what's going on. And God wants to give you and I strength to be encouraged to trust him. Job knew that when the trial was finished, the result would be that he would be like gold. He said that in the first passage that I read. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And some of the reasons that 
people are put into the trials of life. According to this story, I see some things regarding the refiner's fire that, that stuck out to me. Number one, not everyone that professes God is really following him. Right. Let me say that again. Not everyone that professes God is really following him, but there is a remnant that belong to God. A remnant means like a smaller portion. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that it's not your job and it's not my job to decide who's a real church, what, who's a real believer. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But the word of God teaches us that you will know them by their fruit. And the reality is this, is that people profess and they say that they're Christians. They say that they're following after the Lord, but only the Holy Spirit really knows what's on the inside of the heart of man. And God is looking to purify a remnant for himself, a people that will serve him and that will live for him. It's not good enough just to say you're a Christian. Child of God. God's looking for people that will serve him. That will live for him. Listen, when I served the world, when I served, I, look, I used to serve the devil. I'm going to tell you that right now. I used to live in the world and I was going 110 miles an hour in the world. And I didn't look back and I didn't think twice. But praise God, if I'm going to serve Jesus, I want to serve him. Amen. With my heart and with my life. Amen. Not everyone that professes God is really following after him. Look at Matthew 7, 21. Jesus said it this way. He said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my father, which is in heaven. Jesus said it himself. <laughs> not everybody that says my name, not everybody that calls me Lord is really going to be a follower after me. Instead, those that are going to serve the Lord are going to follow after the will of the Father. Now, I've got to tell you something. You can't, this isn't, Christianity isn't supposed to be some rule book. Because you and I can't make a bunch of rules in our life or we can't read the Bible as though it's a rule book and try to say, oh, I'm going to do what the Bible tells me to do because you can't do it in your own strength. Right, right. I need you to know right up front that the only way that you and I can serve God, the only way that you and I can get up each and every day, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, even whenever we're facing situations and, and circumstances that seem to be stronger than us is because Jesus has died on the cross and provided grace to us. Amen. A super, not just forgiving, forgiving grace. I'm talking about supernatural grace, supernatural strength that will empower you and I to walk for God. Amen. Because you can't do it in your own strength. Because you're, you're fighting forces that are stronger than you. Yeah. Satan in his strength against your strength is stronger than you. Demon spirits in their strength against your human strength is stronger than you. But in Christ, hallelujah, he is your victorious warrior. Right. He died on the cross. He went before you and, and not just once again to, get, to forgive you of your sins so that you could go to heaven. But so that we could learn to keep our faith anchored in him and that, he would re that we would receive grace and that we would be empowered to live this life for him so that we could truly be the children of God. Amen. We're talking about a remnant right now. Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. You know, this is the very verse that Jesus quoted when he was about to go to the cross. He said that they will smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And you know what Peter's response was? Peter's response, not me, Lord. <laughs> not me, Lord. I'm not going to scatter. I, though they may try to kill me, I will not turn my back on you. And whenever Peter said that, all the other disciples, amen, that's me too. But what happened? As soon as they grabbed a hold of Jesus, they all went running in different directions. See, many times we think that they we're more strong than what we really are. The Lord knows how to create situations to humble us. Amen. To bring us to a place where we recognize that without his power and without his hope, we're not going to make it. He said, despite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered and I will turn my hand upon the little ones and it shall come to pass 
that in all the land, says the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. So we're talking about three parts. Two thirds of the three parts are going to be cut off and die. That means that these three parts were people, the people of God, that were saying that they were following after God, but two thirds of them weren't really following after God. Verse 9, and I will bring the third part through the fire. I will bring them through the fire and I will refine them as silver is refined and I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. I got good news for you this morning. Amen. Because even when you find yourself in the refiner's fire, when the heat gets really hot, the good news is, is that what God's plan is to ultimately bring you to a place where he will say, that is my child and I am their God. God tests his people like the refiner tests gold because not everyone that says they believe in God is really serving him. The refiner will test us with fire of trials and tribulations. You know, the parable of the sower describes the seed that was sown amongst the soil that had a lot of stones in it. And there was no root. You know, the stones get in the way and it prevents the root from the seed from sinking down deep into the earth. And I got to tell you this morning, I, you, you know, how do we how do we allow root to take place on the inside of our lives? Well, stones represent things that would impede the growth of the believer. Stones are things that are left whenever a farmer is going to till his land. I mean, I've watched it in movies before. I know in Ireland they grow a lot of potatoes in the ground, but there's a lot of rocks also in their soil. So all those rocks have to be moved so that they can till the ground so that, so that whatever needs to be grown in the ground, they can have a root system. And many times there's things that are left unchecked in our heart and in our lives, and they get in the way. I, you don't need me to start... start specifically saying what they are because each and every one of us in our own lives have our own things that are like stones in the midst of the soil that prevent the root from taking root deep down on the inside of who we are. So that's the first thing. Stones get in the way of the root system. But listen, another thing is, is that we also got to help build a root system. Now, when I talk about getting into the word of God, you got to understand, I'm not talking about doing this as though it's some rule book or that or as though you're going to do your own works and that by you doing your own works, you're going to create some right standing with God. No, but what I am telling you is this, is that if you never get into this book to learn about the Jesus that died on the cross for your sin, you're never going to allow a root system to be developed in your life. Yes, when you come into this church, I know what God has called me to do and I'm not shrinking back from it anymore. I, anybody that's known me for any length of time, you've known that I've always second guessed and I've always questioned even my own ministry. In the last year, God has just showed me. I've always told you what I've called you to do, but now it's time for you to start trusting and believing me for what I've called you to do. And what God has called me to do is to teach his people, his word, to see disciples made for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so whenever you come into this house, I'm going to do my best to preach and to teach the word of God for the way that it's written. But I'm going to tell you, that's not enough. Amen. That's not enough. You need to get into the word of God for yourself. I need to remain in the word of God for myself that we would learn the deeper things of God, that we would learn what it means to hold on to him and to serve him. Amen. We need a root system. Yeah. So one, two thirds of those people that called themselves the people of God weren't even really following after God. But that one third, God brought them through the fire. He refined them. They came to a place where they said, he is my God. And God said of them that he is their people. You see that seedling that doesn't, that doesn't take root in the soil. When the sun comes up, the Bible says in this parable of the sower, when the sun comes up, just like the trials of life, that little seedling gets scorched. The trials are too heavy. I mean, what do you what do you do whenever? How many times have you heard the story? Come on, church, help me out here. How many times have you heard the story where people say, "Man, that that person hurt me mm. in the church." Yeah. yeah. You, you, and I've said it before. I've been preaching this since the day we opened the doors of this church. 
If you haven't been hurt in the church or if no one in this church has hurt you yet, just hold on, my friend, because it's going to happen before you know it. Because why? Because we're a bunch of imperfect people in this room. Right, right. Amen. And we're desiring to serve the perfect Christ. Right. And we're all in the midst of a fire. We're all in the midst of a trial. And we're being refined. And the impurities are coming up to the top. Yeah. And they're coming to the surface where God can see them. And listen, sometimes it's not just God that can see them. Sometimes we can see the impurities in each other. But I'm here to tell you that those trials of life with a root system and holding on to God in the midst of it all, it will purify us, it will strengthen us, and it will cause us to look more like the Lord. Amen? The next point I wanted to bring out to you is that he puts us in the fire because we belong to him. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 12 through 13. Peter is writing to the church and he says, Beloved, he's talking to you. Peter's talking to you and me this morning. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed. You may be glad also with exceeding joy. What that means is this. Is that whenever you and I came to a place where we said yes to Jesus. Yes Lord I want to I wanna know you. Yes Lord I want to serve you. Guess what? You were now at odds with the world. The world is against Jesus. Right. The world, when Jesus came into this world and again, and religion, and religion did not want him. The world did not want him. Jesus came for sinners, amen. Sinners that were willing to recognize they were sinners and that they needed, they needed salvation. Amen. But but many people are against the Spirit of Christ. The world is against the Spirit of Christ. And and as you and I connect ourselves to Jesus. I'm here to tell you that we're going to be at odds with the world. Yeah. And so we ought to not think that it's a strange thing when we find ourselves in the midst of a fiery trial. Because just as Jesus suffered, we also many times will suffer. Now, the direct context right here is, is that when we take a stand for Jesus, that we'll see many times people will come against us. But I also got to tell you, that whenever we claim Christianity, when we claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then the, then the things that are in us that are contrary to the Word of God, that's also going to cause some strife and some things going on in our lives. It's also going to cause some, some fiery trials to take place in our lives because God's not willing to leave us the way that we were. That's right. You're not going to leave the way you came in Jesus' name. You're either going to get softer towards the Lord or you're going to get harder towards the Lord. You know, Lauren Larson used to say all the time that the same sun that softens butter hardens clay. Mm, that's good. Amen. And the same, and when the word of God goes forth, one of two things happens. We're either going to be softened towards the presence of God or we're going to be hardened towards the presence of God. The world is against Jesus. And sometimes the world may be against us. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Peter says this again. He says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations or trials, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that God doesn't just leave you alone? Amen. Amen. One day he's going to return. Do you believe that this morning? <laughs> Do you believe that Jesus really is going to come back one day and that when he does, amen, the work that he did in our lives while we were on this earth was all in preparation so that when we saw him, amen, it would, that, that, he, that we would be welcoming him. He says, goes on to say here, whom having not seen you love. Isn't that true? 
If you're here this morning and you love the Lord, you might not have seen him with your physical eyes, but God has revealed him to your hearts. Amen. He's revealed him to your hearts and to your mind. And you said yes to Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit showed up in the middle of in, in the midst of your heart, you knew that God was real, even though you never saw him with your physical eyes. Yet believing you rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of of your souls. He said, even though you might be in heaviness for a season, the word heaviness there describes grief or sorrow. I don't know if you've ever experienced grief or sorrow since you've been a Christian. I'm sure that that's kind of like a little bit of a silly statement. I'm sure we've all experienced grief or sorrow since we've been Christians. I know that I have, but you know what that word season means? It means it's a short temporary period of time. Even in Job's life, it, was, it didn't last for the rest of his life. It was a short, temporary period of time. And the whole time, God is wanting us to line up with him. The whole time, God is wanting us to submit and surrender to him. Many times, the reason that the trial lasts longer than it has to is because we're stiff-necked and we're rebellious and we're refusing to surrender to the will of God. So even though we might be in heaviness of grief, just remember that it's a short, temporary period of time. It doesn't have to last our, it, the rest of our time on earth. It doesn't have to be that way. We can surrender to the will of God. Amen. And the faster we surrender, the faster we'll see the grace of God Amen. flowing in our life. Yes, thank you, Jesus. The third thing that I want you to see is that he puts us in the fire because he wants to prepare us for his use. Yeah. You know, the, in this scripture, you can go to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 4. In this scripture, in the proverb, this is Old King James English. But the last word in the scripture, Proverbs 25, 4, the last word in the scripture says, for the finer. And... I didn't realize when I first started reading the King James that really, if you look in other translations, newer translations, the word is actually a refiner. So I always just thought that what it was saying is, is that if you take away the impurities from the silver and the gold, then there comes forth a finer vessel. And that is true. You know, when you take away the impurities from the silver and the gold, you have a vessel that's more pure. But really what it's saying is, is that when you take for away the impurities from the silver and gold, now a vessel is able to be made that that's, can be used for the purposes of the refiner. Because yeah. he's the one yeah. that removed the impurities. He knows the quality of the metal. This is one where he creates this vessel and he says, this is good for my use. I'll keep this in my house. I'll hold on to this yeah. one for myself. Mm. He puts us in the fire because he wants to prepare us for his use. Yeah. In order for us to be a vessel that he can use, he will have to remove the worldliness of our sinful nature and produce the godliness of Jesus in us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you end up with a piece of silver that's all tarnished and you try to turn around and sell that metal to someone and they're looking at it and it's all ugly and it doesn't even shine and you're trying to get top dollar for that, that's not going to work. It's the same thing with gold. If it's not shining and if it's not pretty, people don't want to pay top dollar for gold. That's not, oh no, this is some really good gold. It looks all black and looks all tarnished. It's all dirty. Nobody wants to come out of their pocket to buy that. The reality is, is that many times as vessels for to be used for God, there's, there's inadequacies. There's certain things in our lives that, that, stand in front of people's faces and they see those things in our lives and it makes it difficult for them to want to know the Jesus that we're professing. It makes it difficult for them to want to know the Jesus that we talk about because what they're doing is, is that they're looking instead of at a diamond, they're looking at an old lump of clay. Mm -hmm. Now at the same time, let us understand this. God knows exactly what he's doing in your heart and in your life. And he's the one that can turn a lump of coal into a diamond. Yeah. 
Yes. He's the one that can refine gold that has impurities in it. He's the one that can refine the silver and pull the dross out of it and make a vessel for the finer. So it's not your job and it's not my job to judge other people and to see the things that are going on in their lives. But we need to understand that we all have things in our lives Amen. that God wants to deal with. Yeah. So don't consider it strange when you find yourself in the midst of a fiery trial. No. Many times it's not just for the person that's going through the trial, many times it's also for the person that's right next to the trial. Yeah. You find yourself going through things, but guess what? God is also testing your faith. Yeah. Right. God is also wanting to know whether you're going to hold on to him or whether or not you're going to just quit in the midst of all of this. Thank you, Lord. Help us, amen. Help us to hold on to Jesus. Yes. In the end of the story with Job, I just want you to see this in Job Chapter 42, verses 3 through 6. If we could get maybe Naya and the rest of the musicians to come up, we're going to get them to play us a song as we close out this morning service. We're going to worship the Lord. Amen. The altars are going to be open if you want to worship the Lord up front, if you want prayer for anything, if you're going through a trial. If you find yourself in the midst of the trials of life and you're asking God to have mercy in your situation and you're saying, yes, Lord, I see that there's dross and impurities in my life. That's between you and God. Amen. Amen. But but he does want you to share it with him. He does want you to to bring it to him and to ask him to work to work with you, to work in you. In Job chapter 42, verses 3 through 6, Job kind of like reiterates some of the things that God has already said to him. Job, Job reminds himself of what God has already said. God asked Job, who is he that hides counsel without knowledge? And like, in other words, God had a sit down with Job. God wants to have a sit down with all of us. He says, who do you think you are, Job? That you're going to have a conversation, that you're going to contend with the Most High God. And Job realizes, though, at that point, therefore have I uttered things that I did not really understand. Things that were too wonderful for me, which I knew not. At one point, God also said, I want you to listen to me, Job. I'm going to ask you the questions and I want you to give me some answers since you seem to know so much. He says, here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of you and then I want you to give me the answers. There's a couple of things that I just want to close with and want you to know this. After the trial is over, Whatever your trial is that you're going through, I need you, to, I need you to trust me when I tell you this. If you will hold on to Jesus in the midst of your trial, if you will hold on to the Lord no matter what, and you will cling to him and you will say, God, there's nowhere else for me to turn. There's no going backwards for me. I have truly found that you are good and I want to live for you. That number one, we will understand God better after the trial is over. Amen. Look at Job 42 verse 5. This is what Job says. Before I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I want you to know that when you go through the trial and you will trust the Lord all the way through it, that God will make you reveal himself more clearly to you and he will walk more closely with you. And when that trial is over, you will have known God better in the end than you did before you went in. That's some hope for you to hold on to this morning. Number two, you will be humbled through the trial. See, many times we allow pride to rise up on the inside of us and we think more highly of ourselves than what we ought to and God's not going to share his glory with another. God does not want his people walking around puffed up and full of pride. What he wants us to do is willingly lower ourselves in his presence.
presence and to allow him to receive glory as the refiner begins to get rid of the impurities and get rid of the dross and he allows his glory to be reflected through us. He allows us to shine his glory. I'm telling you right now, when you go through the trial, God will humble you through the trial. This is what Job said in verse 6. He says, wherefore I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Now this is a man whom the Bible said was he was righteous in the eyes of God. He was walking with God. But there, but there's only there was only one who was who was completely without sin. His name was Jesus. Every last one of us have faults and failures in the midst of our life. Every last one of us sometimes in certain seasons in our life become prideful and become puffed up. And we look at other people's situations and circumstances and we look down on them and we think that we're doing better. God's not okay with that. God wants to do a work in each and every one of our hearts. As the musicians play this song and we worship the Lord together. Let's just worship the Lord. Let's give him our hearts. Let's let God do a work in us. Amen.